I wanted to play in Europe from the get go. Um, I actually had an MLS offer coming out of college, like a, one of those draft contracts, I guess. Um, it's, MLS is funky, so I don't know if everyone knows the rules, but I had a senior deal on the table, but my agent had a offer from Burnley for a trial right after the MLS combine. So I didn't sign it because I wanted to go on trial and kind of see what would, what would happen. On today's episode, we sit down with my good friend and teammate, Aiden Quinn. Uh, we touch on all areas of the game, um, including what it's like growing up as a son of a professional player, uh, the importance of family when in tough times through the sport, uh, his time on trial at Burnley and the experiences he had in Europe, as well as the plans for life after football. So sit around and enjoy. This is In The Loop with Jack Blake, an Indy 11 podcast. We bring you an insight into the lives of professional athletes with an emphasis on the mental side of sports. Welcome to In The Loop podcast. My name is Jack Blake, your host, Indy 11 midfielder and number eight. And this podcast is all about giving you guys as listeners an insight into the life of professional athletes and focusing specifically on the mental side of the game and bringing in guests each episode for your entertainment. And I would love to introduce the first guest, USL legend, USA legend, left foot, wand of a left foot, Aiden Quinn. Thanks, Jack. It's an honor to be the, uh, the first guest on your podcast wouldn't want anyone else mate um yeah so to start off born and raised in san diego california uh tell me growing up there what was it what was it like for you i mean you played there a few years um i think it's one of the best cities in america um the weather unbelievable obviously uh you have the beach you you have a lot of things to do um big soccer big soccer community um so yeah i think it was i loved it obviously uh growing up there have a big family so we uh most of them are still settled there which is nice so when i get to visit it's it's a fun time but uh yeah miss the weather a little bit especially right now in indiana but uh the sun's starting to shine a little bit yeah i can say san diego's beautiful place um can't imagine what it was like to grow up there but i can imagine it was very good um, and you mentioned your family. Uh, your dad was a USA legend himself, uh, Brian Quinn. Can you give the listeners a, maybe a bit of a, an introduction to him and, and how he played a, a big part in you becoming a professional athlete? Yeah, so he uh, he's, was a professional soccer player. He born in Belfast, Ireland. Both my parents were. He moved to England when he was, I think, I want to say 18 or 19. He signed for Everton. Was there for a year or two um, in the reserves. Never played a first team game in the Premier League or anything, but had an opportunity to come to America. Um, so he took it and played a few teams over here in America and in Montreal, but settled in San Diego. And once they were there, my mom said that she was never leaving that place. So <laughs> she uh, put down roots there. Um, he played for the big indoor team, San Diego Soccer's indoor is big back in the day here in America. Uh, he became a citizen. When he became a citizen of the U.S., he got called into the national team when he was about 31 years old. So he played from 90, 91 to 94 for the U.S. national team. I think 48 caps. Got cut right before the 94 World Cup. Um, and then that kind of pushed him on to coaching where he became a coach. Coach San Diego Soccer's in the indoor league. From there, Coach San Jose Clash at the time, uh, who were in the MLS. Now they're the Earthquakes. Uh, and then when he got fired from that job, came back to San Diego. Um, obviously a big family, so my mom stayed in San Diego. There's six of us. So she was with the kids. He was in San Jose for a couple of years, came back, and then coached uh, club soccer. He's the director of a youth team our youth club there and uh, also coaches University of San Diego where uh, the loyal used to play. Wow. So, uh, yeah, that CV is uh, extremely impressive. He's um, interested to know the relationship you guys have. So first question, I guess, is how much with him being a professional footballer, how much did that affect your pathway 
and your decisions and choices. Were you naturally and organically brought into the sport or was it more so of, you know, your dad was very, very involved and very, very more, not pushy, but was he, was he definitely wanting to be involved or did he kind of let it grow organically? Uh, so I'm the youngest of six. So for me, I'm, I'm, I was always around the game. Uh, older brother and sisters played. So I was always getting dragged to the fields no matter what. Um, it wasn't like I was doing stuff at home or anything. It was always, we're going to my, your sister's game or we're going to your brother's game. Uh, or I would be going with my dad to his work, which was the indoor team or whatever. So for me, it was, I grew up around it. I loved it. Um, I was, I felt like maybe I was born into it, but I wasn't pushed into it. So it wasn't like, oh, you have to play soccer or else. We, I have a sister who didn't play, but other, everyone else did. Um, and so it's kind of just, that's just what we did in our family. We're, we're a soccer family. Everyone kind of knows my dad in San Diego. Um, but yeah, I grew to love it. Um, and my dad in no way was really pushy about it. He, uh, he'd give me advice. Uh, he would let me know when I wasn't playing well or if I was being a little big too, or a little too big headed, <laughs> but, uh, he was never telling me, uh, let's go train or, you know, we have to do this. We have to do that. He was always telling me if you want to, if you want to do this, you want to be professional or you want to play in college or whatever you want to do, you have to do it yourself. Um, he would always say, I can't do this for you. If you want to do it, go go kick the ball, go go outside, go play pickup soccer. Um, he would always be there to play with me or go shoot and do that stuff if I wanted, but in no way was he ever like, hey, let's go. We're, we got to train for two hours right now mm -hmm. or um, kind of like that. So I think that's the best way. I mean, he made me really want it, and he was always there to support and help, but it was never him pushing me and saying, you have to be a soccer player or – anything like that yeah I guess for my personal experience as well and uh you know I guess the intense nature it is growing up in academies especially where I'm from in, in England you know it's the uh the parents have a lot of influence on on a child's development on and off the field mm -hmm. um and not a lot of kids are have the benefit of their parent being a professional athlete or having that had that experience so it can be a dangerous dangerous territory for parents to navigate really would you say from your experience um that the parents involvement how, how what percentage would you give the the parents involvement for full potential moving forward um i think this actually i've thought about this because obviously i have a daughter now i'm sure you've thought about it with uh, leo especially but also mm. your daughter mimi um and i think my dad had a, had a good feel for it it's I think they just have to be there. They have to support you and be willing to help you in any way that they can, but don't be pushy. Don't overstep. Um, I don't feel like he ever overstepped my coaches, even though he was, I played at the club where he was, he's the director, but I, I never got the sense of coaches were in fear that, Oh, you're, you're coaching Brian's son. Like you better play him or you better treat him differently. Um, I like to think that I still work hard and I, I do things right, but of course, growing up, you never know if you're doing things properly, but my dad was always there to definitely make sure I acted right, but he would never, never gave me um, that nepotism kind of thing where, oh, you better play my son or my son's the best. Uh, if anything, it was a little the other way where he wanted me to be better and show more because he knew that's, he obviously knew what it took to be a professional in yeah. that level, so... He's always there with advice, but again, he wasn't pushy, um, and he would always put it back on me to be take ownership and be the one that makes myself successful. Mm. So you touched on slightly that your your dad had a pretty difficult experience with being cut before the the World Cup. Obviously, you go through your career, and the the mental side of the game is very important. And and uh, I can't imagine what that feeling must have been like for him. What was the background to that to that story? So he was an older player on the uh, national team. Obviously, he only started with the U.S. team when he was 31, like I said. Um, so he always said he had a he felt he had a better uh, outlook on it because he was an older player. He was coming to the end of his career, so he really soaked in all the moments. Um, maybe when you're 20 or 21, you think it's just gonna keep happening and you're gonna get these call ups or like the game just keeps you just keep growing and growing but at his age he was he saw the, all the ups and downs and 
he was at the pinnacle for him. Um, and then the World Cup was coming to the U.S. So in '94, so that would have been massive. Um, mm. Obviously, he always says that he thought he deserved to be on the team, but he also knew that there was other players that played better together. So he didn't want to ever take away the shine from other players and say, I, I was better than this guy, I was better than this guy, but he thought that he had uh, the qualities to help the team. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I know it was tough on him, but I think that also pushed him on to be uh, the coach that he is uh, and the person that he is. He always always told me and our family growing up, you have to be humble, you have to work hard, and things will work out. Um so in that moment, I'm sure that's not what he wanted or how he wanted it to work out. But in the end, I think it's worked out the way he is or the, the, how he wanted it. Um, mm. He's in a good city. He has his family. He has friends. Um, his, his, he loves his job. He's always on the field. Um, this guy's on the field probably 345 days of the year. Yeah. Doing the youth soccer, doing the college, it's... That's brilliant. It's crazy how much energy he has. Like everyone's like, "Oh, is he still coach?" I'm like, "He's out there every single day, and he loves it. He the passion he has for it. I, uh, that's one of the things I, I envy the most. He just every single day. It's the passion that he, he gives to kids. I think, um, and I think that's what makes him a good coach and what I look up to. So fast forward to now, um, he must be so proud of what you've achieved in in your career. Take a guess, by the way, doing some research on Mr. Aiden Quinn. <laughs> Take a guess. How many professional appearances does Mr. Aiden Quinn have? Oh, me. Oh, man. A little less than I would like after this injury, right? <laughs> but uh, I know I hit, was it 250 last year at some point? So I'm, let's, let's go 255. Ooh, 275. 275, nice. all right. That's a hell of an achievement. <laughs> uh, to go further, two bonus questions. How many goals professionally? I just. 54. Oh, 55. 55. And how many assists? 51, right? 50 or 51? 51, yeah, yeah. 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 That, was, that. that was a tough one last year. I was, uh, they kept saying the 50 50, and I couldn't get that last yeah. assist. Yeah. You got it. You maybe need better teammates. <laughs> no, I think it was the passing from me. <laughs> Fast forward to now, you've you've had a tough, tough time of it, really, recently. Um, you. Uh, in August, am I right? In August or September? September, mid September. Yeah. So, just to paint the picture for the listeners, um, we were in a small sided game in training. Uh, you kind of took an off step and felt something in the knee. What was your initial emotion, or how would you explain how you felt in the moment when it happened? Did you know it was serious? Did you not know it was serious? How, how were you feeling in the moment? In the moment, it was it was strange because I've never had a big injury. Um, I think the most I've missed is three games in uh, consecutively. So I've never had a big injury. So at, at very first, I didn't think it was a big injury just because I haven't experienced that. Um, it didn't feel great. Uh, I heard a lot of cracking um, of my knee, but I never. I'm pretty positive, especially with injuries. I never wanted to think that it was it was bad. But uh, the longer I kind of that session went on, it was. I couldn't really move it, obviously, but the adrenaline was pumping and like I couldn't really like settle myself down. So I think subconsciously I thought, okay, this might be really bad. But mm -hmm. again, I was hoping it wasn't. Um, I was trying to be positive. I told Brooke when I got home, well, maybe I hyperextended it, um, going to the, get an MRI tomorrow. So we'll see. And then I woke up in the morning and couldn't couldn't get out of bed really. I couldn't walk. I was she was hobbling. She's like, are you okay? Like. Seriously? And I was like, uh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what the scan says, hopefully. But uh, yeah. yeah, scan came back and yeah, tore, torn ACL, torn meniscus. So it wasn't great, obviously, the news. But uh, first big injuries, like I said. So in that sense, I felt lucky because this last year was my 10th year going in professional soccer. So playing since I was three or four and not having anything serious like that, um, that's lucky I think so uh from there yeah I just had to kind of take it head on mm. so you mentioned obviously you've got a very special family yourself you've got Jovi the little one and your wife Brooke what part I think from my personal experience you know it's a lot of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes mentally for me and uh, the support system I have is being able to go home and, and talk openly and be vulnerable with with my wife what role did Brooke play in in that sort of moment there yeah, she was massive. She's, uh, I think that she's 
obviously the most important person in my life. Um, she helped out a lot. I, I was actually, we were talking and like going through the process and I was like, I mean, I can't imagine if someone was single and having to do this. Like mm. I couldn't walk. I couldn't get out of the, the couch for the first week. Um, she had to basically bring every meal to me. Um, all that stuff. I, and then on the other end of it, we had Jovi, obviously, who's active and active one-year-old who's nonstop. So that made me feel bad because I know how hard it is to watch her on your own. Mm. And she kind of had no help for the first four to six weeks where I couldn't really do much. Um, so on one end, I was super thankful that Brooke was there, obviously, to help me. On the other end, I felt terrible because I know how much she had to do, um, how much she was going through with she had to deal with a baby and then she was dealing with another baby and myself where <laughs> she had to basically do everything for me. Um, so once I could start moving a bit and kind of go upstairs to the playroom and lock Jovi and I in there, then I could, she could get a little bit of freedom. But mm. yeah, the first four to six weeks, I think it was, it was, it was tough on her, which in, in, in turn made it tough on me just from the outside and like feeling bad about her doing everything. But Again, so thankful, obviously, to to have her and uh, yeah, we talked and I was thinking, yeah, if, if I didn't have you, that would, this would have been really, really tough um, mentally, emotionally, mm-hmm. uh, obviously, physically. That's the injury, but those those other two, the mental and emotional aspect, that would be uh, that'd be hard, I think. Yeah, and uh, a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes, you know. I mean, us as footballers, we are big babies, aren't we? We yeah. come home and <laughs> our mood is dictated by how well we've trained, how well football is going, you know. I guess uh, for me, my wife will always joke that, you know, come the off season when we go from training every day and playing every day to then no activity, no exercise, it kind of, we go a bit stir crazy. And so it, it is important to have that, that support system and also moving around a lot. I mean, you've played, I have here... Mm-hmm. You've got six professional clubs that you play for, and you've actually stayed at the same club for a few years. But moving around, I mean, that's not easy for for Brooke as well. Like, how does yeah. how 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 are the off seasons for you? How do you navigate through the uncertainty of, of the you know not knowing what's going on? <clears throat> yeah, that part is uh, that 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 part's tough. I think for us, we know what we're getting ourselves into, you and I, uh, the players, the guys, we know what we're getting ourselves into. When you bring in a wife or a girlfriend who's new to it, I think that's where it's, it becomes tough because they don't know what they really signed up for, right? Um, they don't know that, oh, your contract's up at the end of the year. They're saying, oh, so you're going back? And you're, you had to tell them, I don't know. They're like, what do you mean you don't know? Um, yeah, I'm just hoping my agent calls me with the deal, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and they're like, okay, is your agent call? And you're like, nope. They're like, why not call him? And you're like, that's not really how it works. Like, yeah. I hope I want him to call me, but uh, yeah. So it's, that part is tough, especially in the beginning when they're just kind of learning the process. Um, now, obviously, she understands it's, but it's still less, uh, still just as stressful. Um, even more so, maybe with the family. I know when I was at Phoenix, she was she was happy. She's saying this is gonna be one one or two of the least stressful off seasons that I've had because we had the guarantee contract, we had everything, and I was like, well, maybe not. Uh, we had 10 days to move to Indiana, so she had to pack up the house, uh, had Joby, who was, I think, three or four months at the time. Mm-hmm. I drove across the country with the dog, and she she got on the plane. So, yeah, that's that part is tough. Uh, that's the, the part that not a lot of people see, but... Um, Again, you have to give credit to the the girls for that because I I know it's stressful and it I feel bad putting her through it, but obviously they do it and they they get on with it without complaining and they let us chase our dreams, which um, eternally gr- grateful for. So a part of the process of chasing the dream, when was it? What age do you think you were at where you were like, okay, I'm gonna give this a good go. I think I could make this a profession and I'm gonna be a professional footballer. Yeah, that one's uh, interesting because growing up, I always wanted to be a professional soccer player, obviously. Um, and kind of growing up, you think it's going to be easy. Like, oh, you, like you're like you're maybe one of the better players in your team. Oh, yeah, I'm going to be a professional soccer player. And then the older you get, you realize, okay, there's a lot of really good players out there. Um, and probably a little different for you because you're actually around the academies and you understand that a little bit more. I had my dad, obviously, so that helped. But, yeah, growing up in youth soccer, everyone thought they were – they could be a pro and it, it's easy and they just need their chance or whatever. And then I think it was around 
14, 15, my, we were watching a game, my dad and I, and uh, it was like AC Milan or somewhere. And he goes, how far do you think you're away from this level? And I think I said like, you know, five or six steps. And he goes, buddy, it's like 20. You're 25 steps, maybe, maybe 30. Like you're not even close. Don't like get it through your head. You're not even close. Um, and so that was, a, that was kind of a quick realization. Like I was kind of mad saying, what? why is he saying that to me? But also it's like, okay, yeah. You're probably right. Yeah. Um, and then we took a trip to Liverpool with my uh, club team growing up, played a few of the academy teams, and I think that was the kind of the moment where I, where it's kind of switched, um, and I was like, okay, if I want to do this, I have to, have to really go for it. I have to put in the effort. I have to put in the the hard running, the hard, the hard work really to get it, to get what I want, and so probably. 14, 15, 16 is when I really started pushing and started seeing a lot of growth. Um, athletically, I wasn't great growing up. Maybe a lot of people say I'm not great now, but if you saw mate. me before, <laughs> yeah, you would say, yeah, yeah. But um, so, yeah, really grinded for that. Uh, and then, yeah, did the, did all the steps, basically, college, and then playing professionally. And uh, I'm thankful I didn't reach what I thought I would in the levels. Obviously, everyone wants to play in the Premier League and everything, but uh, to make a life that I have by playing soccer, and I mean, every day I'm thankful for that. So for the listeners out there that are in a situation themselves where they want to make that next step to becoming a professional and wanting to really give it a good go, what piece of advice would you give in terms of training alone, of what things to train, but also intensities how often like what what advice would you give to someone that's looking to break through yeah it obviously differs with ages right um i just but i think the biggest thing is you have to just love the ball you have to enjoy training you have to enjoy going and kicking the ball by yourself because kind of like what my dad said no one's gonna do it for you so you have to love that grind and enjoy it because for me especially not athletically gifted nothing too special but uh i just worked hard and i think i've worked for everything i've been given um so just going in a racquetball court and just getting the ball passing it turning uh working on body shape and turning and getting to the field with a buddy and just passing the ball long range passing or just shooting um just but it's every it's every day basically just trying to get better and trying to learn. Um, and then also the other side is I watched a ton of soccer growing up, I think maybe because I was lucky with my family, but also that's how we bonded. But I, I also enjoyed it a lot. Um, and so I loved watching soccer and watching players in my position and picking up habits that they did or trying to play like them. Um, and th in that sense, you kind of start understanding the game more and more. Mm, yeah, definitely. I definitely agree with that. Watching the game and putting yourselves in the shoes of another player and, and seeing it from a different angle is one of the biggest learning curves I had when I was in the academy myself. Were there any part of you, you've done the, you lived the American dream, you've stayed in America your whole career, was there any part of you that wanted to push the boundaries and go outside or? Not? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I wanted to play in Europe from the get-go. Um, I actually had an MLS offer coming out of college, like a, one of those draft contracts i guess um it's mls is funky so i don't know if everyone knows the rules but i had a senior deal on the table but my agent had a offer from burnley for a trial right after the mls combine so i didn't sign it because i wanted to go on trial and kind of see what would what would happen um and burnley was in the championship at that time uh pushing for promotion they got promoted that year but my sense was hopefully go in there see what the level's like and maybe i can be a guy that they train and work hard but in 18 to 24 months maybe push to see if I can get in the team um because I knew I wasn't ready um for that level yet and if people go and see the championship it's the level is ridiculous it's it's very very high especially from college but it's very high it's very intense and quick and sharp um so going over there was eye-opening um but it, I loved it um and it was a risk it was definitely a risk it didn't pay off for me obviously but uh, I'd probably still do it because you, if if it does pay off, it's you're in a really good setup. And for me, that was my dream. Um, so I went to Burnley on trial. I've been to a couple other places in England on trial. Went to Norway on trial one year. Um, 
went to Scotland in, while I was in college, and that would, could have been an option, but I preferred to stay in college at that time. So I've always had those ideas, but uh, I'm also thankful that I've been in the USL and I've seen it grow and kind of grown with the league as, itself. So hopefully I can take that into my next career maybe, but we'll see. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because coming from England myself, I <clears throat> didn't really know what to expect from the American game. Uh, I came over to the US in 2016 and I was coming over to the NESL at the time, which was second division, and I didn't know what to expect. You know, I was I was probably a bit overconfident in the sense of I thought that it was going to be easier than what it was. I was tremendously surprised at the, the level of the the players and and ever since then year after year it's getting better and better and it's a shame because until until you see and you've been immersed in the environment of being in america where the game has come on so much in the last five ten years people back in the uk it makes it quite difficult to for the level to be respected by the people that haven't seen it and and it's a shame because people don't get the views they don't get the views internationally just yet but I was very surprised at the level when I first came over. And like I said, every year it's it's come on even even more. And I would assume when your first year was 2014 with Orlando City, how would you describe or what would you think are the biggest differences to back then to now? Yeah, so for me, I was lucky. Orlando was going to the MLS the following year. So they put together a really good team. Uh, so that team had quite a few MLS guys that are signed for Orlando for the next year. Uh, so we, we had a very good team. Uh, we kind of went through the regular season pretty easily. Uh, and then just like a lot of the USL teams that go into the MLS, if guys aren't signed by July, August, September, it kind of gets a little weird because now they're starting to think about their future, if, if they're going to move up. Um, so we lost the first round of the playoff game, but – we had like Kevin Molino, we had Luke Bowden who went to the MLS, Rob Valentino, Darwin Seren. Uh, we had a bunch of guys that ended up in the uh, MLS. A, kid, a guy that played in Ligue 1 in France, uh, Adama and Bengay. So we had a good team. Um, but the USL at that point maybe only had 13 teams. Really? Uh, and huh. a couple, and the, like Galaxy 2 was in it. So a couple of MLS 2 teams. Um, and we actually played a Friday Saturday game. We played Friday, I think, in I want to say it was like Pittsburgh. Then the next day, we were playing in Rochester. No way! Yeah, so it was, back to back. Yeah, cra- <laughs> crazy things like that. But taking we got sleep- any back to back games this year? <laughs> <I hope not. laughs> so playing playing games like that, doing sleeper buses. Um, yeah, and yeah, seeing the growth now. Uh, obviously, the USL has a ton more teams. Now there's a second division in the USL. But like you said, I think the level is a little underestimated by foreign guys. Uh, there's a lot of good American players, but also there's a lot of good foreigners that come here. Um, as we know, we've seen it grow. Uh, it's, it's getting better every year. I think even the money's getting better. Owners are starting to really finance the league a bit. Um, now we have a CBA, so I think that brings up the standards a bit, uh, just the professionalism, because now teams have to do things a little bit more properly where maybe they weren't before uh so yeah i think overall i think the players are getting better but also the owners and the clubs they're also doing things better and and proper so it's good yeah i think the uh the uslpa that's come in has definitely brought a standard that is um a non-negotiable really for clubs and i think when you have something like that it creates a strength of the league creates a strength of the teams and ultimately the players and standard of play and then it brings in more fan base so i think that in itself is a win-win for everyone um, so in terms of MLS for you, my opinion, looking at you and your career, for me, it's a no brainer. You should have been playing MLS minutes. Why, why was that a decision that you decided you wanted to play every single game? You didn't want to go up. Was there never an option? What's the reason that you've not played more games in the MLS? I wish it was my decision not to play. <laughs> uh, no, I've never had the opportunity to actually sign for a team i mean i got drafted by philly um and i went there after uh for a full preseason um and they had a bunch of center mid so i like kind of the first day or two i was like okay maybe they're gonna release me because they had eight nine ten center mids already and i was uh 
kid coming out of college. So I was hoping, or I wasn't hoping, but I was thinking maybe they release me and I can maybe try to go somewhere where there's not as much competition. Ended up going the whole preseason with them, even after I think MLS had like a date to submit their rosters. Didn't hear anything, so I was thinking, okay, maybe they're going to keep me around because they didn't say I'm not not signed or not coming back. But then flying home, they told me I wasn't going to be signed, which kind of pissed me off because I was just thinking, why would you guys keep me here for six, eight weeks when you knew you had all these guys already signed? Like, if there's no room, there's no room. Like, you can't change that. Or if I wasn't good enough, that's no problem. Just let me know earlier, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then, yeah, so I played in the USL a bunch. I had a, the year I thought maybe I'd get some interest was um, – Maybe my second year at Louisville, we did well. We got to the Eastern Conference Final, lost to the good Red Bulls team in um, penalties. Uh, but then the other year was in Orange County where I had good good stats but played really well, got to the Western Conference Final, won the Western uh, regular season. Um, but, yeah, I, had a, I signed with Orange County just to have that security, but I had a $100 buyout. That's for any wow. MLS team, a hundred dollars. So, Damn. and by the uh, way, hey. just to just to add some some context to the Orange County experience, eighty six appearances, twenty four goals, twenty four assists. For me, that's MLS numbers right there in the in the USL. <laughs> I think broadly speaking, like there aren't many players that do make the jump USL to MLS. But the players that you do see make the jump when they do make the jump, and you watch them play. For me, there's, you can't tell much of a difference. Maybe, maybe over the course of time and um, you know, when things shake their way through, that then maybe. But I would definitely, in the next five, ten years, would like to see more USL players being given the opportunity at least. You know? Yeah, I think, I think hopefully it trends that way. Um, I think you and I have both seen it. I think the top guys in the USL, there's no problems with them in the MLS. I, I think they're capable of being guys on the roster, even being coming starters. I, th I think the big difference in MLS and USL is obviously the DP players. Those guys are very, very special talents. But after the top six guys, I think, I don't think there's a huge difference. Um, I don't, you could disagree or other people could disagree, but I don't think there's a massive difference. Uh, and I think the top guys in the USL could no problem handle themselves in the MLS. Uh, and I think it's up to them if they – they want to play every game or if they want to fight for competition and spots. But, um, yeah, I think hopefully we do see more of that jump because I think in England, it's great. If you do well, you get promoted. So you, that that's kind of natural where you're doing really well. Now I get to try my, my luck in the next league. Or if you're doing really well and maybe you don't get promoted, there are still teams in, that are getting promoted. They might bring you on, but here in the America, it really, that really hasn't caught on. Um, there's a few guys that I've played with that have done really well. Mark Anthony Kay, Kyle Smith. Uh, so those guys have played in the USL and they've gone on the MLS and they've become starters and key guys for their team. So I think it's very capable for a lot of guys to do that. Yeah, and I think, I think as well, like if you had a crystal ball in front of you right now, is there going to be promotion relegation on the on the horizon? <laughs> I don't think with the MLS and USL, you know, I don't. I th maybe if USL wants to do it themselves, that'd be great. I think it'd add a little something different, right, to uh, soccer in America, uh, especially the way it's been done. But you could also see the MLS owners. Why would they want to risk that investment and get relegated? So there's always – you have to see both sides of it. But for me, obviously, a guy that played in the uh, second, third division most – or his whole career, uh, I would love promotion relegation just because it's based on merit. So if you do well, you get – that chance to play in the higher league. Yeah, and I think it's a, it's a little bit of a shame what's happening with the US Open Cup, but um, I think that competition itself, similar to the FA Cup back home in England, it's that's like gold dust, especially for the lower league teams, you know, mm -hmm. and having that excitement and the promotion relegation on the horizon. So if I know you want to play as long as you can, just like me, what would you, any idea of what interests you want to do after your career? I mean... I know you're a very intellectual guy, very smart. Uh, you're switched on. There's uh, got to be something ticking on back there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I want, I want to coach. Uh, I'm really interested in the coaching side of the game. Uh, I'm doing my, some of my licenses right now. I've done a few before. Um, but, yeah, I, I enjoy coaching. I enjoy – I want to be around the game still. Um, I think 
obviously my dad is someone who I look up to, so maybe that's also why, but I enjoy that side. I enjoy the tactics, the the relationships, um, and yeah, that's that's something I really want to do, as well as maybe sporting director type role, because I also enjoy watching players and trying to put together a team or see who would play well together, that that type of thing. Uh, those things both both really interest me, but again, that's not an easy life, so hopefully I can carve myself a decent career in those those ones. So do you feel like, for me, I feel like a little bit of procrastination, you know, when it comes to ending the career, I'm just like, sometimes I just don't want to think about it, you know, I don't want, but it's important to obviously plan. Um, come the day, what do you think, how do you think it's going to be? I personally feel like it's going to be difficult mentally to get over the fact that your body, especially used to the physical activity every day, and then all of a sudden, a sudden stop, and then you have to pick up a new career. You know, there are many, many players that are in that situation. What, what, what do you think, what do you think is the best way to navigate through that period of time? Yeah, I think that'll be, uh, that'll be really hard. Like you said, there's a lot of guys who struggle with that part. Uh, I think a little different for maybe, you and I, where we don't make a ton of money like the Premier League players, so we're going to have to kind of jump into a career right away. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I hope I can continue to play for a few more years and keep going as long as I can where I feel good and feel like I'm contributing. But, yeah, hopefully I also have a, a plan in place where I can jump into a, the next career and hopefully get my feet wet really early and uh, continue to learn and grow and start – kind of working my way up in that that ladder and that chain of uh coaching um because i know that also there's a ton of people out there that want to be coaches so it's kind of that grind again of how are you gonna become the best that you can hmm. so you've come across in your career many players many coaches um there's a very important question i'm going to ask you today which you may have already known about but i'm going to ask you your best five-a-side team with players that you've played with or against, played with or against, or against, or against. Uh, your your that dad, really... your dad could be in. It, your dad uh, could make the team. You see, tell me. <laughs> I'm not gonna put him in because uh, oh. make his head big, you know. But <laughs> my dad has two fake hips. He got two fake hips early, like maybe before he's forty, and I beat him in soccer tennis once, I think. <laughs> So he he was quality, and I, everyone that I've run into that knows him, they said how good he was. But I never actually played with him when he was at his prime, so we we can't put him there. All right, uh, all right. So who's your, who's in that? Who's in goal? All right, I'm gonna do a team w that I've played with, and then I'll do a team that I played against. Oh, so, I love okay. that, love that. Okay, um, so team I played with. I see goalie was uh Greg Ranjitsing from Louisville City. I played with him. Um, uh, and now he's at. He's in Toronto, his hometown. Yeah, uh, he was, speaking of lads that made the jump, didn't yeah. he? He He's, got an opportunity. He MLS, made the jump. He? he went to uh, Orlando City with James O'Connor when he got the job. Then mm. he went to Philly and Minnesota United and Toronto. So he's carved out a good little career in MLS for himself, which is great to see. Mm -hmm. Good with uh, his feet then if you're putting him in the small-sided team. Decent with his feet, great shot stopper. You know, I need I need the ball to be out of the net, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm also not gonna put anyone on our team right now because I, I don't want guys to get mad in the locker. No, we don't want right? any salty lads in. No. Yeah. <laughs> otherwise, you'd be in there. Don't worry. Nah. <laughs> uh, let's see. I'll do a defender. I'll do a one-two-one, one, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Harrison Delbridge. He was uh, at Cincinnati with me. Um, big Australian lad. Plays in South Korea now. Yeah, wow. played, he went from Cincinnati to Melbourne City. And then from Melbourne, he's in uh, South Korea. So he's actually having a really good career for himself. I think big center back hard, but also good with the ball. Um, we'll score a few from uh, range in the small sided. Lovely. Um, midfield, Kevin Molino uh, in, from Orlando City. Played with him. MVP that year. He was unbelievable. No one could stop him. He had a good career in the uh, U.S. or in the MLS as well. Mm -hmm. um, was his best position an eight or a ten? What, what where would you put uh, in the? For us, it was a ten, no doubt. A ten, um, no doubt. Yeah, well, you give him the ball and he's gonna go score, or create a chance, or yeah. He, when I played with him, it was it was a joke. He was he was too good for the league, but then also in training, like when he decided he wanted to turn it on, it was all right, game over. There you go. Mm -hmm. um, See the other midfielder I would pick probably one of my favorite players to play with. Um 
Corbin Bone. Mm. Uh, I played with him in Cincy. Good player. Yeah, he's, uh, for me, just unbelievable soccer player. Um, and just, I, I enjoyed playing with him in the field, in the midfield. Uh, would just keep the ball, never lose it, play play one twos, unselfish. So it's, yeah, great player. And then up top, we need a goal scorer, right? Mm-hmm. That one's tough. Let's fair few to choose from from your career. Yeah, there's two. There's uh, Cameron Lancaster. Um, yeah, I'll go with Cameron Lancaster. He's he's a beast. Mm. Um, played for Louisville City, obviously. Probably the hardest shot I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's. Uh, yeah. I remember playing against him. Extremely creative. Um, yeah, I can imagine him ripping up a small side yeah. of the field. That's for sure. If he's injured, I'll put Thomas Enovolson, who was a. Uh, Danish guy played yeah. in the World Cup, um, yeah. played at Orange County with him. Um, very good finisher. Um, loved Cristiano Ronaldo, so you know he's gonna go and score and want to win. So yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So when he when he came to the USL f- to Orange County, that was directly from a Scandinavian team. Yeah, yeah. In he, Sweden, uh, in uh, Denmark, in maybe. Denmark. Yeah, yeah. But he played in, I want to say, twenty fourteen World Cup. He. Uh, yeah, he played in the World Cup, which is insane. Wow. Um, so yeah, so you get a guy that come over to the USL, especially at that point. Yeah. How how old was he when he arrived at the uh, Orange County? I want to say he was twenty nine, and he had a great year. He uh, he was an MVP finalist. Um, the year I had a lot of assists. I think the main reason was because he had a lot of goals, so mm-hmm. that helped me out. Um, mm-hmm. So what do you think sets when you could you see that it's a player that's played in the World Cup? Could you see like what was the gap to I don't know, the previous nine of that year, what would you say was the biggest difference that just set him apart to be an MVP? Uh, he was he was very technical, but his finishing was unbelievable. He, kind of like you were, you give him the ball in a good spot, he's going to score. Um, and you knew that. So uh, he had great finishing, great mentality. Um, yeah, he's obviously a winner. So some guys that's hard to deal with, um, but if you understand them and you know where they're coming from, I you really enjoy them on your team. And I, I like guys like that. I, I like guys who will do anything to win. So mm-hmm. if you give me 10 of those guys, I have no problem going on the pitch with them. Um, yes. Right, so that's the that's the five-a-side team that you played with. Yeah. Any any players come to mind for the against? Oh, against, yeah. Well, I've had some, I had some good games. Um, those uh, friendlies that we play against uh, bigger teams. So. Oh, yeah. The preseason ones? Yeah, yeah, preseason or mid-season where a team comes over for their preseason. Um, I played against Fashion Schweinsteiger, Tati, Alexander Pato. Uh, Damn. Yeah, so big players. Let me see. The goalie, what's his name? He scored a bunch from Brazil. Siri? The guy that used to take the free kicks yeah. and the pens. So he was on Sao Paulo. We played them. So I'll put him in goal. He'll probably bag oh, he'll one bag or two, couple, right? Yeah, a couple, yeah. yeah. I'll put him in goal. Defender. Um, who's a quality defender? See, defender's an interesting one in small sided yeah. because right? you kind of, I don't know, like sometimes I think I'd want my defender to be an attacker. You know, I just want pure attack. But then you do need someone who's going to put to hold it block. down, right? You need someone who's going to put their life on the line to block. Yeah. Uh, let's come back to defender. Okay. Midfield, I'm going to go Darlington Nagby, 100%. Oh, yeah. I think. Well, uh, he's he's different level. Uh, we saw it last year against Columbus. But uh, he's an Akron guy, so I, he would come back and we'd and he'd play and – I, I love watching him. I think he's he's different, uh, different gravy, that guy. So he's definitely in there. Francisco Tati, for sure. Um, and then up top, because Tati's kind of a forward, but let's put him in midfield, right? Mm, put him anywhere. Yeah. Um, hold on, let me get the phone out. I, I, I have done this before. <laughs> I've done this before, but at a starting 11. <laughs> Oh man, this guy! This guy was different. Uh-oh. I was on a trial. I played against him. Oh, I was. Uh, where was I on trial? Uh, is maybe Huddersfield? I was on trial. Oh, we yeah? played Leeds. And wait, on... wait, wait! You gotta let me guess the player. <laughs> this guy. Give me a clue. Give me a few clues. <laughs> crazy. He's crazy. Okay. But he was out of the first team for probably being crazy. But we were playing like their twenty ones or reserve team. This guy was 
Unbelievable. Unbelievable striker. Striker. Playing for Leeds in what year? This is probably 20... Between 2013, 2015, 2012, 2013, 14, around there. You gotta give me another clue. Uh, wow. I would have a little blonde patch. <laughs> you, you'll love it. It's not coming to me. Go on, give it me. El Haji Doof. Oh, Doof. Wow, Man. wow. Nutcase. Man, he was nuts. <laughs> what a player. He was, he, it was, it was too fun for him out there. He was, he was, I can't know if I can say this, but he was taking the pee out of us. You taking know? the piss. Yeah. You can say that. Oh man. It was, I was like, I was on trial, but I was watching. I was like, this guy's different. Like, what are we doing here? He was at Liverpool as well, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's so, yeah. He loved the dive. He'd get you a few fouls in small sided. Oh, he loved he was, the dive. He was so strong. Yeah. He yeah. was, like, you try to get the ball, it was impossible. Yeah. And then uh, I put uh, my center back. I'll go back. Bastion Schweinsteiger. We'll just have him in there. Huh? Mm. He, yeah, he was decent. Some good names there, <laughs> mate. Yeah, not a bad player. Yeah. <laughs> oh well. So coming towards the end of the podcast here, um, thoroughly enjoying this so far. But um, just to finish, if you could go back and give yourself at the start of your professional career one piece of advice, what would it be? One piece of advice. Um, Maybe I would just say go for it more. Um, maybe, yeah, just go on trials more or, uh, yeah, just go and try to maybe try my luck at a, in Europe a little more or, yeah, just take that extra risk. I think I'm, I'm, I'm for risk, so I, I took my risk before and I'm fine with that decision, but I think maybe take even more risk just to see if it works out or not because obviously I enjoyed every single second I've had in the USL, but I'm, you never know what – could happen if you went to a League One team or or a League Two team, and if you did really well, you know it. It only takes six months, and guys get bought, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe maybe that would be my only advice. But again, I don't really look in the past, and I don't regret anything. Um, I've enjoyed everything. So yeah, I don't know if I would change anything, but if I had to, that'd probably be the only advice. Well, I'm glad you you haven't changed because then we wouldn't have got to play together, mate. Right, yeah, exactly. so <laughs> thank you so much for coming on today. Um, it's been really interesting to sit down and as a good friend and a good teammate, it's, uh, it's been an honor to have you on here uh, you, to bless us with your presence and uh, some of the stories that you've given us there are fantastic. So uh, I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you for listening to In The Loop podcast. This is your host, Jack Blake. You can find our episodes wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also go and check out our YouTube channel, Indie 11. This is In The Loop with Jack Blake, an Indy 11 podcast. Be sure to like and follow this podcast and check out other great podcasts on the All Indiana Podcast Network. To watch the video of this podcast, subscribe to the Indy 11 YouTube channel.